I will take this talk at the, at the meta level. I see that there's been very different types of talk. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an overview of following Professor Steger, Hilker. So we've had um, <laughs> a bit of everything, which is great. So it's going to allow me to make some key points once again. So that's in your brain. And then I'll bring you to what's next in our field and how we can come together to tackle some, some of the big issues. So the first thing is, why, why exoplanet? Why do we care? Well, my interest in exoplanet is that these are new vantage points from which we can reassess some of the theory we've built on this unique sample that is a solar system. So for a century, our understanding of planet, planet formation is based on, on this unique sample. And to some extent, these theories could be biased as the outcome of a political election. The prediction on the, of this could be biased if only based on the survey of a couple of people from the same family. So same family, same history, value system. Here, different planets, sure, but still around the same star they've been through the same formation process and so forth. So what does it mean exactly to, to get a theory that on what, what do we need? At the first level, what we need is, um, is a good sample quality. For example, if you want to predict the well-being index as a function of um, household income, you kind of want to know for sure what does your metric mean? What is the precision that you can have on the well-being index as well as on the income per se? Once you get there, you can start to look for trend. Then you want to make sure that you assess the problem dimensionality, dimensionality adequately. So what does it mean to get XK in India versus XK in Luxembourg? How does that infect your life satisfaction? And then you want to make sure that you have an adequate pool site to not only, um, well, you want to make sure that you have an adequate pool size to have significant information on the topology of your parameter space. Great. So in exoplanets, we started to probe that in 1995 or so. Uh, the first planet detected around the main sequence stars here reported on the log-log plots as a function of mass, period, um, radius and period. In red, the planet in our solar system. And then you'll see that things have ramped up quite significantly. In over two decades, we have reached a point where we have 30, well, actually now about 4,000 exoplanets found in about 3,000 planetary systems. So our sample size have significantly increased. Thanks to that, we find new planet types, such as hot Jupiter, planet of the size of Jupiter, orbiting the star not in 11 years, but in only a couple of days. We find super Earths, planets that have no analog in our solar system. They are bigger than their biggest rocky planet, Venus and the Earth, sorry. Um, but actually smaller than the, the, the gas giants, the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. So we can't really say what are the nature just a priori, just based on that information. So you can see that with the pool size, we've started to challenge our understanding of these planets. Now, is this all we've found? Obviously not. One second. There we go. Well, actually. All right, so is this all we found? No, we found planets without stars, free-floating in the galaxies. Planets with multiple stars, like Kepler-16b, that offers this iconic double sunset, like Tatooine in Star Wars. We found planets like this one, that has 37 rings, about like 600 times the rings of Saturn's. And if Saturn had such rings, you'll be able to see it by naked eye in the sky. We find planets being pulled apart by the star, by the gravitational field of the star, so literally dying as we speak. So that's how, that is how much diversity we found already. Now, when you think about exoplanets, there's really nothing to do with planets. If so you think planets, you can like, resolve them specially. You can see the stripes of Jupiter, the, the rings of Saturn's, but exoplanets are very different, and that's where, where we do need data science. You can zoom as much as you can of one of these planetary systems, beside the one that you can directly image, and we're gonna hear a talk about that in a bit. Uh, well, all you get is that, one bright dot. And so the question is, how can we study such a system with one bright dot? Well, we can study the brightness change as a function of two key dimensions, wavelengths and time. As a function of the wavelengths, for example, when the emission spectrum of the star is shifted to the blue, to the red, when it's moving around the common center of gravity, you get information on the mass of the planet. On the other hand, as Sarah spoke about it at the introductory talk, when the planet passes in front of the star, you can get a constraint on the apparent radius of the planet as the flux drop relates to the planet-to-star array ratio. 
Now, obviously, the signals that we get are slightly more complex. This is an example of light curve from uh, Spitzer. You do have rho, uh, you have the, the dominant noise, obviously, that you see is a photon noise, so the Poisson process behind the emission. Um, and then you have other effects, such as detector ramp, detector ramp et cetera. I'll show you another example of noise that we have to deal with. For example, here, you do have uh, the effect of intrapixel variability, meaning that the photon falling on one side of a pixel will lead to a different number of electrons than if falling on another side of a pixel. So as a telescope jitters, you do have these uh, CISO um, signal on top of the transit that we're looking for, which is actually right in there. So orders of magnitude smaller than what you're looking at. And that's for the transit signal. And once we want to go to Atmospheric study, we're looking at fraction of this transit depth variation, so significantly lower. And that goes into this idea of sample quality. Moving further, because we've been further, um, if a planet is detectable by both technique, we can get the density. And then we move to the bulk composition of the planet. So we can have this kind of diagram that shows as a function of the size, so radius and mass here in Earth's radius and Earth's mass, uh, different planets on top of which we can add curve, composition curve. So then we can start to discuss how this planet mostly made of iron, what is the fraction of water that they have, or do they have large or cold H2HE envelope? We can also add another dimension to this, which is the types of star or the equilibrium, equilibrium temperature of the planet. And then progressively, we do expand the problem dimensionality. Then we can look at the atmosphere of the planet because when a planet passes in front of its star, a tiny fraction of the stellar light goes through the planet atmosphere, and we can start getting insight into what could be there. How do we do that? We look at how the flux drop when the planet passes in front of the star changes a function of the wavelengths. If you have an atmosphere that's opaque at lambda 1 but transparent at lambda 2, then you would have a slightly deeper drop at that wavelength. Example here of the hot Jupiter HD 209458b, where you can see observed with Hubble in 2013. You can see how the transit depths change as a function of the wavelength. So transit depths can also be related to an apparent size of the planet, which increase at 1.4 micron, because for this specific case, we, do, we can show that there is water in the atmosphere of the planet absorbing at that wavelength. Now, um, how far exactly have we gone in terms of characterization? Well, as I said, we've, we've been used to specially resolved planets, but we've actually managed to start doing maps of exoplanets, even so, again, the only thing that we see is one bright dot. So how do we get there? Same thing, wavelengths, time dependence, we look at the flux. So what happens to a flux from a system when we look at it over time? When the planet passes in front of the star, you do have a drop that relates to the planet's shadow. When the planet passes behind the star, you do have a standard reference which relates to the star alone. And then when the planet turns around the star, assuming that it's tidally locked for now, you do have a constraint on the longitudinal brightness distribution of the planet. So if you look at how the flux change over one period, you can basically reconstruct a longitudinal map of the planets. So let's look at an example and just to get an idea of how far we can go in terms of insight already with facilities that were not developed to do this kind of science. This is Kepler-7b. This is about um, three years and a half of data, uh, face folded. It's a planet has an orbit of about five days or so. Um, so these are hundreds of face curves, face folded. You do have the transit that happens at the phase zero, right here, and the secondary eclipse, so when the planet passes behind its star at 0.5. So this is the flux coming from the planet. We've, it's normalized by the stellar flux, put at reference, uh, by the time of secondary eclipse. So it's really all this flux comes from the planet and we're in the visible. So we've shown that the planet has no flux coming in the infrared. So everything we see will be related to reflection, not the planet being really bright and shiny in, in the visible. So if the planet was uniformly bright, we'll have a simple Lambertian signal, like you see here, something that's symmetrical around the secondary eclipse when the planet is reflecting most of the light and then zero when the planet is on the other side showing the night side. But what we get is obviously something different, something brighter afterwards, and it allows us to show, demonstrate that the planet has 
part of its day side that's significantly brighter than the other, allowing us to go one step further and basically tell us the story that this planet has a non-uniform but permanent cloud distribution on this side. And the story goes that um, hot hair comes from the substellar point, move to the night side where the temperature drops low enough to form clouds that goes back to the other side and keep on shining, um, reflecting the light back from the star up to a point where the temperature at, in the atmosphere raises enough to vaporize these clouds. Owing to the temperature, we can place constraint on the cloud. There appears to be silicate dominated clouds and so forth. And again, all of that owing slowly to uh, the photometry of the whole system. Fun fact, the, the, the wind speed, uh, what the, the jet that actually brings uh, the air to the other side are supersonic. So it's a completely different regime from the planet that we used to, obviously. This is for longitudinal map, but we can move that to 2D map, actually, or somehow quasi 2D map. How, by looking at the deviation uh, from the expected eclipse shape, which was found uh, in this case in 2012 for one exoplanet HD 1A9733b. And what we found is that, um, well, I'm going to skip this. When a planet passes behind its star, actually I'm not, it is progressively scanned by the limb of the star. So if you can, if you have the precision to look for these flux changes, you can make the, you can look for differences between uh, a uniformly bright disk being eclipsed by another and a non-uniformly bright, and then you can reconstruct a map. Of course, there are some degeneracy, and you have to deal with that. I'm going to go through a couple of them very quickly. The impact parameter affects also the shape of this stellar size, eccentricity, argument of the periastron. So there is some degeneracy there. And that goes into the problem dimensionality that I mentioned before. Uh, and in order to uh, help the problem being less ill-posed than it actually is, you do want to combine a data set that also constrains this other parameter, the transit shape actually affects eccentricity, argument of the periastron, so speed distribution. Phase curve help constrain the um, brightness distribution as well in a complementary way to the eclipse map. And the radial velocity also help place constraint on the orbit. You do a joint fit, and then you can get map of the planet somehow in 2D. Now what's gonna come next in that context is actually three-dimensional map. Because when you observe a planet at different wavelengths, you're probing different optical depths of the planet. So you can create maps in these different wavelengths and get an insight into what's going on in these different strata. Great. So this is for tidally locked planet. Now, what have we done for others? With the Spitzer Space Telescope in the infrared, we study uh, the transient heating of this hot Jupiter. So this is HD 809, uh, HD 0606 on a 111-day orbit. And we've looked at how the planet is receiving the flux from its star in only 12 hours, moving from 400K to locally 2200K, and then radiating this out. So owing to this data set, we've been able to place constraint on a couple of interesting parameters, such as the absorptivity of the layer probe, the radiative and convective time scales, allowing us to better understand the rotation rate of the planet, and also bring a new insight into how such planets get to end up circularized. So um, yeah, I won't show all, the, all the, the animation because that's not the point, but basically you have the data set here where you see that the planet is basically uh, completely black at 4.5 microns, so way too cold to be seen. And then by the time it passes close to its star at about six stellar radii, <clears throat> it increases in temperature from below 400K, uh, 350, sorry, to as high as 22 locally and then cools down in 12 hours. Um, and so that's what you can do in the infrared. If we were to have data in the other wavelengths that we could probe different regime and maybe also see how clouds, because there should be haze at least, uh, vaporized uh, over time as the planet passes close to its star. Last example of what we've done, and the point here is to show how much um, it is important for us to approach this new parameter space with a physics-based approach, is the case of um, some relaxed stellar heartbeat for a planetary companion. So it's at P2B that we had observed uh, around secondary, secondary eclipse, which happens here. Earth is there, so it passes behind its star just after periastron passage. The idea was to look at how the energy dumped by the star in the atmosphere of the planet was redistributed. 
the thing is that we found something very different that when we, what we were expected. Uh, we found in the residual of the, well, actually in the signal of the occultation uh, oscillations. And what we showed is actually that these oscillations were related to an harmonic of the orbital frequency, a series of harmonic of the orbital frequency, which was really unexpected for these planets, but which could be uh, a new way to look at planet-star interaction, but also a new way to potentially detect planets that are on highly inclined orbits, uh, which cannot be detected in any other way. Now, the point of this couple of examples is that you've seen with the map, you've seen with the um, oscillations, there is a lot to do with new data sets when you do want to scratch a bit under the surface. So automation is great to take care of nuisance, yeah? But it's also pretty important uh, that we don't rely on this, especially in the context of exploration. So it's important to keep the mind open in that context. Now what's next? Uh, what's next for our field are these crazy facilities, gigantic telescopes that are going to bring us uh, significantly more precise data set uh, on spectral coverage that are um, much larger. So the insights to get are unprecedented. <coughs> Just to give you an idea, the plot that I showed, so this is the type of spectrum we'll get for Neptune science planet with the James Webb Space Telescope. And what I was showing you earlier, the H2O features observed with Hubble, is this little thing here. So we're really entering a whole new realm in terms of planetology what we could consider something as high throughput planetology, new dimensionality, new space, so that's what we, what we want to focus on. What kind of space we're going to be dealing with and how are we going to assess the topology of this space. We have a um, test that's been launched last April that's going to find, I mean, that's predicted or expected to find about 20,000 exoplanets, so seven times more than what we have so far. On our side, with a um, prototype TRAPPIST, um, we've revealed last year the presence of the first planet that has this swinging combination to be Earth-sized, temperate, and uh, amenable for atmospheric study, so the first target for which we could search for signs of habitability and maybe life. But they may, as Professor Seagull said um, two days ago, they may also be bare rocks. Uh, the atmosphere might have been stripped away. Now, with such planets, we can, of course, search for signs of life, but we can also completely revisit our understanding of planetary system and terrestrial planets, as we have not four, but seven terrestrial planets around a star that's significantly different from ours and in regimes that are very, very, very different. And so what I, what I really look forward to um, in the context of our field is this idea of expanding the dimension of these plots and then doing clustering in so many ways so we can actually grab or get new, new understanding of, on what's going on, on how this planet has been formed, on what does it mean to be habitable, on what is, to some extent, life beyond how we investigate it, so the, for the chemical parameter space, which Professor Seeger tapped into. Now, in that context, um, how, how will deep learning help? In my opinion, the biggest issue we're facing is simply increased complexity. So we're just increasing constantly the problem dimensionality, and it's just way too, too big for us to handle. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, on the one hand, for transit timing variations. We do use, so what are transit timing variations? Uh, when you have a planet in, around its star, the timing of the transit are periodic. If you have other planets, these timings would actually be affected by one another. So what you see behind me are the tra transit timing variation for the seven <coughs> planets of TRAPPIST 1b. Different measurements are there, and each of them are tugging, changing them from time to time. And so as this relates to the mass ratio of the planets, you could use that to extract mass distribution for the planet. But what we find is that it's really an ill-solved problem, an ill-posed problem, because we actually don't really know how many planets are around. We don't know how planets are actually affecting each other, which depends on what their interior are made of. And suddenly we realize that the constraints that we've placed in 2018 are actually not necessarily that robust. And it is difficult for us to imagine the different family of solution in a space whose dimensionality we don't really know. Similarly, when we want to study the atmosphere of planets, we rely, for example, on 
the um, cross-section database that, if we go further, relates on, how, on our understanding on how each line's absorption lines depends in terms of central wavelengths, well, position of the central wavelengths, amplitude, shape of the, uh, of the line. It depends on the local temperature, pressure, the other gases, and all of these are under assumption, usually very geocentric assumption. The issue being that that, which is fine in, this, in the line space, this linear assumption, which are typically fine in the line space, have to propagate through various exponential when this is integrated for um, the optical depth of a given layer in the atmosphere of a planet, and then another integration over the, the projected disk. And so then you start to see how the complexity of the problem we're dealing with um, is difficult to assess without advanced computing techniques, on top of which goes for transmission spectroscopy, the effect that uh, the star that we tend to model as a uniformly bright disk is actually some non-uniform effects such as uh, plague or uh, spots, which are themselves going to add features on the spectrum that we're trying to analyze. analyze. Yeah. Um, yeah, not, not last example. Um, another example that I wanted to refer to is the aspect of spectroscopy. I said that different wavelengths will be probing different optical depths, which you can see on the plot here that shows uh, the contribution of, as well, that's the contribution of a given pressure level to the signal that you measure in one band here, 3.6 micron, as a function of different uh, atmospheric, uh, atmospheric sorry, model for given planets. So um, the model in blue is a solar-like solar -like composition, much more mortality for the, for the model in green. And what you see that um, the pressure level that you are probing is significantly different as, as a function of these different composition showing that our understanding of lines, and again, for lines and such spectrum, you do have hundreds of millions of lines that contributes to such features. Lines, as well as GCMs, are actually important for us to create 3D maps of exoplanets. Last example is the same. Um, when we start assessing the um, biosignature, the, yeah, the potential for one gas being detected in an atmosphere to be a biosignature. The number of processes behind the production of so, such gases is extremely complex to assess. Now, if you combine that with the fact that we might be biased in our measurements of the abundances because the assumptions that we've done on the line list tells us that oxygen is present at 10%, but it actually is present at 5% just because of this bias that we have, things can get extremely complex and extremely messy owing again to the problems that we are about to tackle in this field. And so, in that context, uh, because of, yeah, great. Because of these um, problems that are increasingly more ill-posed to some extent, um, and because of the fact that to tackle them, we do need to integrate multidisciplinary model. Uh, now we're considering at Ips to build something as Earth 2.0, bringing our expertise from interior to oceanograph to atmospheric, uh, well, GCM people, getting all of that together in order to tackle large-scale problems such as climate change and the origin of life all at once with such things. Um, and in order to reassess all the assumptions that have been made in one field to understand how they propagate in such gigantic models, we will benefit from uh, deep learning and data science in that context because this is an excellent complexity management tool that also allows for pattern recognition. Now, in that context, um, we could use this to assess the dimensionality of specific problems. We could have something like Earth 2.0 but ask one question such as, hey, how does the increase of this gas in a planet like Earth is going to affect this specific parameter? And Understanding the, dimension, the, the dimensionality of that problem will help us guide the experiment design um, to answer that question, but also help us get to a point where we have robust insight because we have assessed all the potential aspect of the answer to that question. It will help us identify the maisons, as David was referring to. That's a great aspect that um, deep learning can bring, which will, oh, sorry, yes, which will, um, 
for example, help us increase the efficiency of um, our model. So in the context of GCM, if we want to integrate that as something significantly larger, we need to approach some of the dynamic local physics through non-parametric uh, scheme. And that's one place where the um, deep learning would be ext extremely uh, helpful, of course. And finally, uh, if we have automatized some of these aspects, we can have a better access to the perturbation. So look for the signal that actually brings this new, this new insight, these new dynamics. Now, um, once we'll have done all of that, we'll be have also the tools to look at this pattern in this multidimensional space and build theories that are well beyond what we had before. So my hope is that we can do that for key concepts such as habitability and life in the future, but that will require very advanced work. Uh, and hopefully with this, you will have some incentive to come with us on, along this journey. So thank you.